Hi, I'm Real T, and welcome to the Real T Dragon Show. And today we are doing a Batman video covering the iceberg or Batman. It's a deep dive. Another one. Let's get into it. I'm really excited. I spent all day yesterday researching this one, and I didn't think it was going to be that big because it was kind of short. But I really wanted to deep dive and go into detail about each and every one of these topics and give you guys something that's familiar, even if you don't really know Batman that well. And so I, you know, I'm really going to be explaining some of these. And the whole point of making this video anyway for me is I wanted to make something that you could talk about at a party. You know, you'd be like, hey, I know some Batman facts. Yo, I just watched this YouTube video. Did you know that Batman had a illegal Filipino movie that came out and the you know, Batman was basically a gangster, but because it was like not done legally, copyrighted, these movies are lost. They were made in the 1960s. Knowing about those facts, maybe you could talk to one of your friends, whether they're into comic books or not, and enlighten them because the lore of Batman is so rich. It is so enjoying, it's so entertaining. They really do stretch the idea of a Batman in so many different direction, which kind of tells you what an iceberg video is. An iceberg video, it starts off at the top. It's like everybody knows the Batman. He's the guy with the bat cowl and he fights the Joker or whatever. Well, you didn't see the other 90% of what the Batman is capable of or what he's done, what's been canceled, what's been lost, the conspiracy, the theories, we're gonna cover all that. What is the real story of Batman? Well, hopefully we learned that today. This was composed by Great and Powerful over on Reddit, so big thank you to them. They also did a big favor and kind of synopsed a lot of these points so that I had to do less research to really get my head around what was going on. But I did add a lot more of information I found online to just give you guys more clarity on exactly what it is talking about for each of these topics. So let's get started. Level 1. Batman and Bill. This refers to how a major portion of Batman and his publication history, the character, the exclusive credits, was given to Bob Kane as the father, the maker, the designer for Batman. However, later it was alleged that Batman was co-collaborated, created by Bill Finger and Finger's legacy was mostly hidden from Kane, because of Kane. And so this is also one of the fathers of Batman and he deserves the credit. And I, I do believe nowadays he is getting more of that credit. His name is involved in a lot of the posts that I've seen, even researching for this Batman whole video. I saw Bill Finger's name everywhere along with Bob Kane. And so credit to where credit is due, the father of Batman, the fathers, <laughs> of Batman. There's also a great Hulu documentary talking about this. It's worth watching. It's called Batman and Kane and it's pretty much about the nitty and gritty ownership of Batman and the struggle between Bill Finger and Bob Kane. It's interesting too because Bill Finger is such a prominent figure in just more ways than one with Batman. Of course he's the father of Batman but I think a lot of the likeness, a lot of his like the way he worked seeped into the character especially when they made it because he was in the shadow of Bob Kane for most of his career but he donned that cow and he became Batman and, and took the bullet you know and it wasn't until way later that he got the credit he deserved you know in, the, in a way it's kind of like Bob Kane was a Bruce Wayne and Bill Finger is Batman itself you know he's that character and he, it's so interesting how the irony and the Storytelling just kind of tells that in itself with these two people that made Batman. The Killing Joke Ending It's a fan theory that states, in the final pages of Alan Moore's iconic Batman graphic novel, The Killing Joke, Batman leans forward and murders the Joker in cold blood. They also made The Killing Joke into an animated movie, and you can watch it online or on streaming services. And it's really fun because it's also open-ended. You're not quite sure what happens between Batman and the Joker. They both laugh, but then there's like a silence and it's just eerie. And it's definitely, uh, that's like the point of it all. Like does Batman betray his moral code of not killing people, keeping justice right and sending him back to jail when he was just in jail? And man, the story, spoiler alert, by the way, this entire video, there's gonna be so many spoilers. So this is your warning. 
Diving deeper, this is how messed up the Joker is in this movie, which kind of leads to like the whole point of this is whether Batman kills Joker or not. Not only does Joker escape from just being in prison, but he takes Professor Gordon's like daughter who is in a relationship with Batman or something like that. And he mentally and physically like just abuses her to where she can't walk anymore. It's terrible. And then he mentally like scars Gordon basically. And Batman has to see all this right happening right in front of him. And then he gets to see like even innocent bystanders and the Joker hurt his own lackeys. So you can see how the choice between taking down the Joker for real or letting him go back to jail just so he can escape again and fuck with that moral code that is Batman's like rounding where he can't kill people. He has to give them due justice in the right way, the way that him and Gordon agreed upon. It's tragic. It's a really sad story. You know, you have someone really trying their best. And I, I think that's why we all really love Batman too, because he has to find a way around that. But in this story specifically, it kind of stretches to the reality of what could happen and how damaging these things can have. And in the comic book, this does have a lasting effect on all the characters and their story continuing on. The original or Batman is brilliant. Death of a family, alternative ending. This story depicts the death of Jason Todd, the second Robin, I believe. And this is really interesting because during the comic release, they let the fans have the power on whether this character lived or died via a Colin Poe. And the fans decided that Robin had to, you would guess it, die. <laughs> However, extra pages were already made and created to depict an alternative ending and where he survives the blast. A uh, majority of those pages are lost along with the original script and plans of the world that Jason Todd would live in. Fans be like, burn the witch! Uh, so, you know, sometimes you really have a lot of hope for like, oh man, these guys are gonna like love this character and not be mad and upset and like let him survive. But the, sometimes what the creator makes is not good enough and they're like, Dude, yo, just kill the guy. <laughs> it reminds me of Dragon Ball Z really when Goku is like living his full life, but then he dies and Gohan tries to take over. But then the fan reaction was so severe, they had to bring Goku back. And now we already know Goku is in the main light of all of the series and Gohan kind of took a back seat. But at the end of the day, the fans really do decide what happens to the art at the end of the day, you know? Because if they stop supporting, then that's the end of the art, which is kind of sad. But fun fact, this Robin doesn't end up dying. I mean, he does stay dead for a while, but like all comic book heroes, he comes back. And this is because he takes his sensu beam, AKA Raza Ghoul puts him in the Lazarus pit and brings him back to life where he later becomes Red Hood. Level two. Then the Dio kills Nightwing. It's no secret that the former editor of DC had a disliking for legacy characters, particularly Dick Grayson and Wally West. Thus, the Dio spent most of his career at DC looking for ways to get rid of Nightwing. The most famous of these attempts was when the Dio tried to kill Nightwing in the climax of the book Infinity Crisis. This plan, however, never came to fruition how much of said death was scripted and drawn is unknown. Any material created regarding the said plot point remains lost and the Dio's grudge against the character is a irrelevant anecdote to the history of Batman behind the scenes. Why is the question here? Why does Dan Dio not like Nightwing? By the way, if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I am so sorry. Uh, you are a professional in the industry. I'm just a little plebling, so don't hate on me too, man. If you don't like Nightwing, you probably wouldn't like me. Anyway, this is what he had to say um, about Nightwing and why he wanted to kill him, basically, to maybe fan off the fan backlash or just let his real thoughts be known. For me, with Dick Grayson, the issue wasn't about the fact that I didn't like the character. In fact, when I said we should kill Dick Grayson, it was purely story driven. We were in the middle of Infinite Crisis. The driving point of Infinite Crisis is the fracturing of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. 
and their inability to work together fractures the impact of the other heroes. I needed a defining moment that would bring these three together after all the troubles, something that they can unite over, a death of one of the characters that touched them all in a way that was going to be perfect. To do that, Dick Grayson was that character. I felt he was the character that everybody had such a great affinity and love for. By putting him in the role that if he died, he would bring Superman and Batman together again and unite our heroes against the great threat, I think that's a noble death. And I think that's something that had value. Some type of deaths happen on Crisis on Infinite Earths. You want to have that level of importance. So there you have it. I get it. It makes sense. You know, Dick Grayson would be, could be that perfect character that could die and unite Batman and Superman. But you know who also is a great character? Um, Lois Lane, Martha. Have you seen uh, Justice League? <laughs> to explain the reference and the joke I'm making, by the way, this is about the new Justice League movie by Zack Snyder. And then there's the Josh Whedon cut, kind of showing them in a future where everything is wrong. Basically, Lois Lane was the humanizing factor of Superman in this cinematic universe. And when she died, she was the connection between Superman and Batman and everything good. Superman went rogue and destroyed everything. And now Batman is teaming up with Joker and other characters to just save the day. But they say that's the bad ending. And there could be a good ending where Lois Lane doesn't die and they all stay united. So it hits a little close to home. But this is comic book. This kind of thing happens all the time. I love the storytelling. Yo, have you seen Zack Snyder's new Justice League remake? It's so good. Frederick Wortham claims. Wortham is a, a psychologist responsible for the book, Seduction of the Innocent. In this book, the author condemned comic books for their alleged negative impact on American's youth. One of the claims is that Batman and Robin shared a relationship filled with homosexual innuendos or undertones. This led to the creation of Batwoman, Batgirl, and the idea of Bat Family. This is another relevant anecdote to Batman's publication history. Yo, Mr. W is straight up just like throwing a little false flag over here, trying to make DC go crazy, which it worked. It's kind of crazy that this one guy made this book red lighting what's happening in the comic books and DC went crazy and we're like, all right, we got to make this whole roster of heroes. So it's just so people know what's in the know and leading to the Bat Family. And so let's get into that one on one time. Who and what is the Bat Family? So the Bat Family, it's basically whoever helps Batman. It changes from like the golden age of comics, silver age, all the different eras of comic books to right now. It has changed and people have come and gone. People have died, people have stayed, people have been revived. But here are the basic anatomy of what makes up the Bat Family. Bruce Wayne, AKA Batman, this guy, childhood trauma due to the death of his parents led him to a bat cave where he was inspired to become the Batman. Tim Drake, AKA Red Robin, not the restaurant by the way, this is completely unrelated. He is the third iteration of Robin. He's more reserved than uh, Jason Todd, who was another Robin who died. Um, Tim also died, but that was in a completely different circumstance. But you know, no one stays dead in the comic universe. We've hit that so many times already in this video. Um, Tim actually works vigorously hard to train to become Robin though. He didn't have the natural talent that Dick Grayson did. And so he had to work hard for it. That's what makes him different. Yeah, in fact, it says here uh, recently in the DC Rebirth timeline, Tim took down a wave of drones, but unfortunately right after that, the Red Robin, AKA Tim Drake, uh, died in the next wave of drones, which sucks. Dang, that's like realistic. You know, you're fighting thousands of or hundreds of drones in the air. You know, and you're just a human without super meta human powers. Sucks to suck. Kathy Kane, AKA Batwoman, who, yes, that means we're going all the way back to the seduction of innocence, right? She's one of the characters that was created for that. Anyway, the League of Assassins took her out. So she is no longer alive. Well, well she is in some universes, or is she? Anyway, moment of silence.
Next you have Jason Todd, a Robin who was captured by Joker and died. Moment of silence. Catwoman, moment of silence. Alfred, moment of silence. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, man. Dick Grayson, Nightwing. <laughs> Helen uh, Bertinelli, AKA the Huntress. Stephanie Brown, known as Robin, but not, she's a girl, Robin, you know? All who have faced death during their relationship with the bad daddy. Moments of silence. I think the core message of what I'm telling you right now is that just don't work for Batman because you will most certainly die at least in one timeline and that's just no fun yeah and the unfortunate thing is that that's always going to happen you know why let's get real meta with this okay comic book readership needs this every time there's a death every time there's a shout of something crazy happening readership goes up so they need that drama they need that realism they need that Grip of good storytelling and sometimes it's done tastefully and sometimes it's done kind of like light-handed like getting shot out by a bunch of droids well miss science tendry so there you have it you know a bang for a buck bad woman's canceled marriage another anecdote that combines editorial drama with lost media in the early years of the new 52 the creative team responsible for bad woman's book was planning to hold a wedding for her character, Kate Kane and Maggie Sawyer. The editors at DC canceled their plans due to the unspoken rule at the time that heroes couldn't get married. This led to a controversy where DC editors were accused of homophobia. The creative teams of Batwoman abandoned the book, cutting their plans in half. Whatever they had in mind for the character is now lost. So I guess there's this underlying rule that characters can't get married in the DC universe, especially for this new 52 universe. Uh, fair enough. Um, I think, you know, the editors should know that. Yeah, it's hard to have an opinion on this one. Honestly, I've never worked for DC in a professional like way, not even as a cosplayer. So it's hard to say. I would think if you're an editor, Editor, Skeletor, <laughs> my pronunciation, man. Um, you would know about things you could do and not do beforehand. And so I think they were maybe pushing it. I don't know. Uh, I don't think having a relationship in that way is bad. But, you know, if we go back to the seduction of innocence, that's, it happened already. It, this has happened before. So maybe uh, DC ain't about it? I don't think so, though. I think... Um, the marriage line is probably really important. They can't get married because that changes the core of the character. Unless you're the Flash and you want to get married to Iris West and then lie about little nuances about your relationship and who you're fighting, what you're doing every season over and over. Oh, wait, this is the CW. Let me just stop talking. I know you guys don't want to hear about that one. Woo! The CW universe. Okay, so I get on tangents sometimes and it's jokes that only I kind of get or people who watch it kind of get. But just to inform you guys, the CW is a channel, right? And they have made so many DC off-brand TV series. It basically, uh, Arrow, uh, The Legends of Tomorrow, DC, Supergirl, The Flash. They've done all these series and they kind of intertwine and like meet each other and collaborate. Like the Arrow will meet the Flash and the Supergirl will meet the flash and the flash will meet the arrow <laughs> and like they'll all come together all the side superheroes have their own story which is basically dc legends of tomorrow it has a lot of the villains and heroes from these all these shows come together and it's basically a big like tv multiverse of actors and characters it's really fun but uh it can't hide from the teen drama that is keeping a secret from people who are part of your team. Even though you've gone over this issue that you guys shouldn't keep secrets to each other because you guys are teammates, you don't lie 101. But every season it's like there's another lie that creates fake drama and fills in 20 minutes of this 40 minute episode runtime. And it's just the way TV works. I get it, I totally get it. But I would think once you married this Iris West girl, which is basically the Flash love interest that you didn't know, it would, all work out but anyway 
uh, to relate it back to um, this whole thing, there is a bad woman show or bad girl show. I haven't seen it personally. If you have, let me know what you think about it. But it's from the CW and it's like this same character with the red hair. And uh, they're doing some creative choices with this character. I honestly don't really even know much about this character. So power to them. <laughs> Let's keep going. Batman Shonen. A formerly lost piece of media, in 1966, Japan began publishing a Batman manga to profit off the 1966 Adam West show. Just so you're familiar, this is the era of like Astro Boy and a lot of classic mangas that were coming out back then, so very lighthearted. Shinji, you know, very like comedic and not too serious. The manga was authorized by DC. It did fall into obscurity until it was rediscovered by DC editors in 2008. DC editors tried to recover most of the stories, however, some of them remain lost in time. So there's actually a good ending to this one. They did find the Batman Shonen inspired by the Adam West show, which if you didn't know, that was the goofy tongue-in-cheek style Batman show where it's very lighthearted and funny. It's comedic. It's very much like an old school TV show where they're just like, bam, pow, and the actual sound comes out, you know? Um, and this is right before Tim Burton and then Christopher Nolan and then Zack Snyder got control of these characters and made them more serious. And so it's very lighthearted and fun. And so I imagine the Shonen is similar. I haven't read it though, and it's online though. So they found Batman Shonen, but did you know that they also made something recently called Batman Ninja? Not related, but kinda is, okay? It's kind of a Shonen. It's directed by Junpei Mizusaki, and in the storyline, Batman is gets in a tussle with Gorilla Grodd and gets in, transported through a time machine into feudal Japan where him, Robin, and all of his Bat family have to face off with Joker and his villains. And it's a really fun, entertaining, action-packed movie. Thanks Afro Samurai. By the way, Afro Samurai's team worked on this same, so you can expect high quality animations. And you, they really do a good way of giving homage to the Japanese culture and art through this movie. And also, you'd be surprised at how good of a feudal lord or shogun Joker really is. You start to realize, man, this guy's crazy. And like, oh yeah, a uh, shogun might be this kind of crazy. He kind of brings it to life in a cool way. So definitely a gem worth watching. Batman Unchained is the scrapped fifth Batman film in the Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton cinematic universe. The story casting and development of the film remains mostly lost. Okay, so this is the fun part. I had a lot of fun learning about this. So before Zack Snyder in his Justice League, Batman v Superman movies and that whole cinematic universe was Dark Knight with Christopher Nolan and all that jazz and that portrayal of the Joker and Batman and a great story, okay? But even before those perfect films, man, I love Dark Knight, by the way, uh, is Tim Burton's and Joe's edgy Batman. This is where the iconic nipple suit Batman comes to frame. There's like a chrome suit. You know, it's these are visual masterpieces for sure. You, you gotta give it to Tim Burton. Like he brought this character to life in a way that had never been fully realized before because before this was like Adam West type Batman you know nobody was taking Batman as seriously but Tim Burton was like oh let's Nightmare Before Christmas this let's make it dark and if you think the cast we have right now is really good for DC and the Justice League oh my gosh I just gotta read this out okay you know you had Jack Nicholson as the Joker George Clooney as Batman at least in one of the movies <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze, Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy, like Jim Carrey as the Riddler. A-list actors in all of these movies. And they really are a product of their, of their time. You can tell right up like the age they were made in when you watch them. And I think it really encapsulated filmmaking back then and the type of stories they were trying to make where it was like, yes, it's a popcorn movie, but at least we did it with a superhero that's entertaining and fun and kind of, you know, you would see it on TV play randomly, you know what I mean? <laughs> In the background. And so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these movies, but 
I really love how everything is connected. And I think it's unfortunate they didn't make a fifth one because, oh man, all the lore or all the details that would have come out of like making a fifth movie would have been fun to just pick, pick out your brain. Because I, what I'm starting to learn about Batman from making this video is that there are so many different Batman and they all really show how malleable this character is and how much you can do with just a guy who likes bats. <laughs> I know that you're probably gonna hate me in the comments for saying something like that, but you know, just a man in a bat suit and his previous trauma, like you can retell this stories a thousand times and there's always something in there that touches and moves people or else he wouldn't be one of the heroes that we love and still see on screen today. A character that's over 80 years old when the first issue came out. Incredible. Anyway, it's been like 30 years since all of those Tim Burton movies came out. So if you want to watch them and let me know what you think about those movies. Yo, I'm all over for leave a comment. Let me know your thoughts or maybe what you thought about it back then when you did see it. Did you see it in theaters or did you see it like at home with your family? I think I saw it on TV. It would just be playing on like my television uh, through cable back when that existed. Oh man. Link in the bio for a Batman Unchained video trailer. Very fun. Joe Chose Motives, a story more relative to comics themselves. Throughout Batman's 80 years of publication, we've seen several explanations as to what were Joe Cho's motives to kill the Waynes. These go from organized mob hits to a cover up by a P word ring to a plot by the Court of Owls. The general understanding, however, is that Cho had no motives, though this keeps being debated. I'm just gonna read it. Give me, okay, I just tried to read this off 10 times, but it just did not work, so here. The man that killed Bruce Wayne's parents, Joe Chill. There are several different versions of this. God bless the richness of Bad Daddy lore. <laughs> My writing, right? One timeline, Joe Chill simply murdered Thomas Wayne, so who is Bruce Wayne's dad, by the way, so his partner could win votes to be in the city council. In another version, Joe is replaced or hires a man named Jack Napier who kills Wayne's parents and later becomes the Joker due to Batman <laughs> or other circumstances depending on the universe, the timeline, etc. Man, comic book lore, so much fun. I don't know why that was so hard for me to do just like off the whim. I had to read that one though. Too many words. This is a fun one. The villains represent Bruce's inner demons. So another popular fan theory, which states that all the villains are twisted mirrors of Batman's psyche. So let me just read this off to you. Scarecrow, the big old doctor, blessed with causing and experimenting with fear and psychological trauma, similarities to the Dark Knight. Batman often uses fear to sway the opinion and actions of his potential victims. I'd say Scarecrow is part of them. Clayface molding and monstrous, convincing at least most of the time, uses images to deceive. Batman is Bruce Wayne. He hides this and uses his position of wealth to make him politically credible. Yes, I'd say Clayface is much like Batman. Two-Face. This one is basically a metaphor. Powerful political figures with one dark side and one more logical side. Sound familiar? Batman. Poison Ivy. This one is distant. She wants to protect her plants. He wants to protect the weak. A comparison can be made, but it's so-so unless you look at their reactions to having their beloved killed. Ivy flips when a plant dies. Batman flips when a person that he cares for dies, especially when it's someone close to him. Harley Quinn. Fun-loving, generally just a nuisance, possibly represents a part of Bruce that doesn't quite like authority. After all, he doesn't sometimes have an easy relationship with people who try to control him. The Joker. This one is the deepest and scariest. He represents two things in fact. One side of Bruce's inner demon clawing, trying to get him to kill the villains. Insanity is both Joker and Batman as they repeat the same actions over and over. Joker wants to break Batman. Batman keeps thinking the justice system will sort these super criminals out. 
This is the definition of insanity. Repeating the same act and expecting a change. But Joker can also do something else. Bruce's tendency as a billionaire playboy to try and laugh and smile his way through his problems. His parents being the main one. Oof. Hello guys, I'm back. This is round two, level three. Let's jump right into it. Jason Todd and AIDS. A story regarding DC editorial, the bulk of it stating that during the early 80s, DC wanted to write a story that focused on the AIDS epidemic. One of said plan involved Jason Todd dying from the virus. Other sources claim that death of the family, Jason's mechanical death, was created as an analog to the virus in the social climates of the 80s. How much of the story was drafted remains unknown and any plans for it are lost. So you know how I'm not allowed to give my opinion, right? <laughs> but I'll be honest, they probably dodged a bullet on that one, uh, not making this story because there's just so many ways you could make that story and make it bad or say it in the wrong way or portray the characters in not the right light especially if you have people writing the stories that haven't gone through it personally or i mean not to say like anybody's been a superhero in real life but i think there's a lot of chance for backlash and not the best way if they would have went on and, and made these stories but that's not my opinion i'm just rambling <laughs> that's coming from a spiritual being on the other side of the room or something like that but honestly taking off the mask this is my real opinion okay when i read superhero stories i want to read a superhero story this is escapism for me so you know i think also from my perspective i don't want to see that issue in that kind of way it wouldn't be what made me want to read the comic if it happened it would have been sad would have affected all the characters in an interesting way but maybe a superhero comic shouldn't be about that maybe that should be a different comic about them so they don't have to repackage robin in that kind of way they can but you know i'd like to see the new villain of the week you know just something to get my mind off of the realism and escape into a fantasy that's what comic books generally are for me gotham high this is a lost batman animated tv show that was meant to feature teenage versions of gotham rogues and heroes the pilot remains lost whether this has any connection to the young adult graphic novel published in 2020 is unknown the graphic novel by the way is by melissa de la cruz there's a link in the bio if you want to watch a little teaser of the graphic novel if you're interested in reading it basically what we're seeing is batman being famous on social media it's 2020 right and it takes place in 2020 for real and he's on his phone and he's getting thousands of likes for photos he's posting because he's a playboy philanthropist billionaire right and <laughs> not iron man though by the way <laughs> um and then it, it kind of if you watch the teaser trailer, it focuses in on a female girl. Now, I don't know who, what her character is, but she's trying to figure out her place in the world. So I think the story kind of is from her perspective, seeing like this Joker-like villain uh, who is like the school bully or something, or, or like Batman, and he's like the popular kid, and her trying to like have just high school drama with this new environment. So an interesting take. I haven't looked into it myself, but if you've read it, please let me know your thoughts on Gotham High, the comic book or graphic novel, by the way. Um, you know, would it have been a good TV show? Who knows? You know, it's 2020. I don't know what the kids like nowadays. YouTube videos? We watch YouTube videos. Return of the Joker sequel, by the way, this takes place in the Batman Beyond universe, which takes place in the Batman the Animated Universe series but it's after that. It's like the future of Batman and his young protege. I'll explain later. This regards to the plan of the sequel movie of fan favorite Return of the Joker movie. The plan is said to involve Batman's clone and an older Catwoman. There doesn't exist any piece of media of this film. Okay, so now I get to explain the fun part. So this actually takes place in the future timeline of Batman Beyond this time our batman hero is terry 
Maginus. And this timeline is a continuation of Batman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures, just for more context. It is the 2020s, we live in a tech future, and Bruce Wayne is old, so he has retired at this point from being Batman. He discovers Terry, though, who has recently had his parents murdered by Joker Z, a gang or mafia group that has come together inspired by the Joker classic villain. Bruce takes Terry in and trains him to become the new Batman after seeing qualities that reminds him of his younger self. Okay, so now that we got that, Return to the Joker is an animated movie, a part of that cartoon show where the Joker comes back to life through like a microchip that's implanted in a body. And, you know, spoiler, it ends up being under Arkham Asylum, you know, once the Batman Beyond deals with him. Joker's body ends up under Arkham Asylum after he dies for the chip. And so that brings us to now, the movie that would have came out was the sequel to that Joker Z movie uh, with the Joker, fan favorite. If you were from the 90s, you probably remember this, or early, mid 2000s, you probably remember Batman Beyond. I loved it as a kid, my personal thoughts, is I always wanted that suit, man. That Batman Beyond suit is so clean. Um, I would have loved to see the animated movie if they did come out with it. I have a link in the bio, by the way, if you wanna see a little teaser of like, a scene from the movie that it's just good popcorn you know what i mean uh classic animation alex ross batboy a scrapped batman graphic novel that was meant to be written and drawn by alex ross the project was canceled and only a couple of sketches and a simple premise exist who is alex ross by the way if you didn't know you should he's a prolific comic book writer artist but has also worked in other professional mediums like M. Night Shyamalan Unbreakable, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, DVD, which I actually talked about in my last video where I did a deep dive iceberg on Spider-Man where Alex Ross is talked about for him doing iconic classic posters and media pieces for Spider-Man as well. You know, everything Raimi's film. His art is iconic. He's done many DC and Marvel miniseries um, you know, if you ever meet him, get an autograph for me. <laughs> for yourself. Not not for me, but just like, you know, you should get an autograph. He's a very talented artist. Batman is in Arkham. A fan theory that claims that all of Batman adventures are the lucid dreams of a man locked in Arkham Asylum. All the Batman rogues are actually his doctors and caretakers. The theory proved so popular that Scott Snyder referenced it in his 2019 graphic novel, Batman last night on Earth. This is a fun fan theory. And it's similar to what we talked about earlier in the video when we talked about the different villains that correlate with Batman and his psyche and they were like the mirror of each other. But this time it's actually the metaverse of if Batman was in Arkham Asylum. How this story goes is after grieving and being depressed over his parents' death, Alfred couldn't control this wild, chaotic, uh, depressed Bruce Wayne. So he sent him to Arkham Asylum, where he became even wilder, more crazy, mentally unstable, same Batman, just in jail. And uh, although Alfred would visit him from time to time, he could still wouldn't be able to control his chaotic nature from the depression. And so this would lead to a whole saga of Batman stories and universe where, you know, Everything he's going through in the main series is a hallucination of his childhood trauma and massive abandonment issues. Very sad. All hypothetical, by the way, and theory. Great Reddit post on this subject. For more details, thank you to Slugboy on Reddit. Link in the bio. Deuteragonist. Deuteragonist. What the fuck is a Deuteragonist? Deuterogamous. Lincoln March's identity. Lincoln March is the Deuterogamous of Scott Snyder Court of Owls graphic novel. This book sets up a mystery regarding March's parentage and implied that he could be Bruce Wayne's biological brother. However, this has never been confirmed and remains an ongoing mystery. So to break it down, let me read it straight to you. Lincoln March is the alias used 
by a mayoral candidate in Gotham City who believes himself to be the younger brother of Bruce Wayne, Thomas Wayne Jr. To be honest, the owl suit is sick. Besides the killing and the violent nature, they would have been a great brother team up <laughs> duo. This is where you're at a party and someone's saying like, hey, do you know Batman has a brother? <laughs> no. And then you'd be like, well, yeah, he does. And he's like an owl. And they'll be like, okay. Yeah, it's unofficial though. Like he could be, but maybe he's not. It's kind of hypothetical. Cool. Costume so cool. It's like, she. Okay, go away. I don't know why I did that bit. Uh, I wrote it. Oh God, I'm stupid. <laughs> I wrote a, I wrote a silly bit. I I thought it would be funny. Uh, these random facts are great conversation starter uh, at any party. Probably I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna use it for sure. <laughs> hey, you wanna talk about Batman? <laughs> and we have made it to level four. B T A S Sandman episode. Batman the animated series has several unproduced scrapped lost episodes. The most famous of which is Paul Dini story where Batman has a near death experience and meets death and dream. Okay, so I've actually found a bit of that comic while doing research and basically what happens is Batman is facing off with Scarecrow, Clayface, you know, Killer Croc and he's getting beat up madly. And so to escape, Batman jumps off the building and shoots his bat claw into some question mark area and he basically like is dangling and he fades off to what could be death where he meets dream and death and they talk about his existence in the metaverse and what is his purpose as a hero and what is life and what is like the psychology of it even like it's so meta because it kind of shows comic book readers reading his story as batman and how him being a hero has an influence people in the comic book but also us as readers which is super meta and he gets to choose batman gets to choose whether to live or to die and of course he chooses life and the next scene you see is robin in a bat wing you know picking up the dangling almost dead batman there's a reddit post on it by bara batman link in the bio for more details batman dracula 1964 could be a musical but it's not in fact it's a lost film written and directed by famed American artist and creator of pop art movement, Andy Warhol. The film was created without authorization from DC Comics, thus Warhol never released it and remains lost to this day. Only its cast and some scenes are available on the internet. Some of this lost media stuff is so interesting for Batman. You know, he never really, I've never really made the connection to Batman and vampires and it kind of doesn't make sense, but don't it? Don't it kind of make sense though? It kind of feels right, but it just kind of feels wrong at the same time. Batman and vampire, but he's a bat, so it makes sense. I've never made that connection. I think that is so funny. Anyway, this has happened before though. In fact, there's an animated movie of Batman versus Dracula, and it came out as a DC series. Oh, and also Batman has fought like vampire-like beings in Elseworlds where there were vampire bat-like beings. So, but this specifically is about Andy Warhol and uh, like probably a more artistic Batman Dracula film uh, would have been very pop movement and iconic like what you heard earlier. I'm sure it's good. Uh, I have a clip down here in the bio if you want to watch it. Just look at that link and you can see what Andy Warhol kind of had envisioned for this movie if it would have came out. Oh, Batman v Godzilla. It's like Batman versus Kong, Batman versus Ghidorah, Batman versus Mothra. Man, they're. Anyway, <laughs> this is funny, man. I didn't think the lore really went this deep. Or, well, that could be, but official could be. You know what I'm talking about, right? So, anyway, this is a scrapped Batman movie, Batman v Godzilla from the 1960s. Evidence from this film regarding Dake's production notes and cast is buried. Whether this was a legitimate film is unknown. But hey man, here's some fan art. It's some it's a it's a cool scene. Imagine like just the scene of Batman flying in the sky. And you pan up and you see a Godzilla in the background. 
And then it's gonna be like, Oh no, it's Godzilla! <laughs> and then you're like, Bad Daddy, save me! Man, maybe, maybe one day, I would watch that. I'll be honest, I would pay money right now to watch Batman be Godzilla. And no, it can't be fan-made, it's gotta be official, okay? And it's gotta be in some alternate multiverse timeline that the Flash is like, Yo, Batman from Justice League, check this out. <laughs> And bam, it's like shows Batman and Godzilla for just a moment. That would be so funny. Alfred is Batman's father. This theory comes from Grant Morrison, Batman, rest in peace. In it, a criminal organization plots to take down Batman by creating a conspiracy theory around the Waynes. The theory claims that the Waynes were degenerate drug addicts and that Martha Wayne had an affair with Alfred? This affair led to the birth of Bruce Wayne. The theory is this proven within the story. However, some claim that it could have been real. I want to dive deeper. So of course I use the most reputable website there is online where you can get your sources and everything, Wikipedia. And it said this about Alfred. Alfred is left emotionally shattered, commenting more than once that even if his biological fatherhood is a fabrication, in a deeper sense, he actually was Bruce Wayne's father, having watched over him for years and feeling he failed him in the last moments. Here's something to think about. <gasps> Here's a good one. Thomas Wayne is Bane's father. Similar to the previous point in a 90s storyline, had Bane suspected that Thomas Wayne was his father. This, however, was disproven in the story again. But, you know, who knows, right? <laughs> Maybe in one universe. Anyway, Batman Fandom Wiki this time says this about it. Thomas Wayne was once suspected to be father of Bane, a man who would one day break his son. However, DNA tests proved this to be false, and Bane's real father was actually revealed to be King Snake. Oh, this is a surprise. I think the line, break his son, specifically, hits really hard. <laughs> I mean, you can see it in this picture, like, damn. The irony is not lost on me. I think somewhere off in the distance of the meta fanverse where anything is possible because of multiverse theories and dimensions, Bane is Batman's brother. It's just not official yet. But hey, if Batman's here for another 100 years, there's gotta be some storyline they wanna go down and maybe they'll choose that story one day. Batman was created by an eldritch deity. This is a plotline from Grant Morrison and Scott Snyder's Batman stories. This focused on Barbados, an alleged ancient bat god that stalked Gotham City. Morrison's Batman is revealed to have been the original Barbados. However, Snyder later on proved that Barbados was actually real and was the one who sent a bat to break Bruce Wayne's window that night he decided to become. Ooh, HP Lovecraft meets Batman. I mean, that's enough, really. I mean, there's a lot to unpack if you really want to dive deep into this one. It kind of deserves its own video, to be honest. And uh, so if you'd like to see that, let me know. Maybe I'll make something. But uh, let's continue to the next one. Level five. We made it. Yes. Man, I've been filming this all day. <laughs> this is taking a lot of work to make. I hope you guys are supporting. Like, comment, sub, all that stuff. You guys are awesome. The Waynes are cursed. Another plot point from Morrison's Batman. In it, it stated that the Waynes were cursed during the 1600s. This would explain all the misfortunes that have occurred to the family ever since. Now, this is an interesting one. Looking further into it, I discovered that Gotham in itself had a lot of cryptic backstory to it. Um, for example, in the 1800s, there were demon worshippers in the city of Gotham, and Gotham itself was made on top of a makeshift asylum. And like, there's this thing called a city god and Doctor Gotham itself, and you know, there's just a lot of rich history in the Batman lore to explore about this. And it's undeniable if you really think about it. Like, is you know the Waynes cursed? Or the Batman family. And I think in a way, yes, it's kind of, there's no other way around it. They're at least a little bit more cursed than your average hero. Because like, let's be honest, all the Batman family have died and come back to life 
and it's funny <laughs> but like you know it's drama drama at the end of the day they have to write good stories but um i think it's worth exploring if you're interested um the history of gotham and just the wayne's family in general it's been detailed throughout the decades that the issues have been coming out canonically uh from dc in little bite-sized bits so it's a worth a deep dive in itself maybe i'll do one one day either way let's move on to the next one flying black batman by ho yat kwan is an obscure 1962 chinese manhwa inspired by bob kane's batman some sites go as far as calling it a ripoff yeah maybe just like my spider-man video that i did a deep dive on iceberg you can watch that it's on the channel this batman also has parody copies fake ripoffs etc but to leave this topic on a lighter note there is an official release uh called batman hong kong it came out in china in america in 2003 batman goes to hong kong after strange videos of you know uh viral chain data is sent to him of people being i think guess tortured and so he goes to hong kong and teams up with night dragon and they take down the criminals to save the day the art is done by manga artist tony wong and the story is by doug monch it's pretty solid unauthorized cinematic universe from 1965 to 1992, the Philippines produced a total of eight Batman films. These were unauthorized and had a more comedic take on the character. Their plots involved Batman fighting Dracula, teaming up with James Bond, going to hell and fighting the devil, as well as Batwoman and Robin film trilogy involving eight-year-old and his mom fighting the Queen of Vampires and the Joker's son. The majority of these films remain lost, and only a few posters, scenes, images, and plot details remain. Truly bizarre, okay? Uh, the legality and everything. Uh, in fact, there's a clip in the bio if you want to watch of this Philippine Batman. It's definitely interesting. I wish I could find more on it, but I really couldn't. Um, but let me get real with you for a second. Batman, uh, the first comic release, March 30th, 1939, which makes batman right now 81 years old he is not a public domain character i don't think he ever will be that's why they keep making more batman movies so he's owned by the studios um but just imagine all the cool creations that could come out for example this filipino thing if they would just let him be public domain and all the fan theories could be made about it i mean that being said plenty of fan films do come out and they get a lot of support by just people who love batman but like i said earlier that's not my opinion and woo, with that we are done we made it to the end thank you for watching yo i had so much fun with this one as you can tell i'm getting more used to this process of doing a iceberg deep dive video if you want me to do another breakdown reaction or a deep dive video on a certain topic or something going on right now in comics let me know in the comics i will cover it and do my best to do a good job and before i go any further i just want to give a big thank you to some of my biggest supporters they've been with me since i've been making skit videos and cosplay con videos to now uh yo prep for it i love you man charles stills you're amazing gabriel arcero thank you guys so much you guys you know it's like i make a video and i, I know you guys are already there in the comments rooting for me and just supporting and i, I appreciate it so much um so you guys have a great day you know yo use these as talking points when you talk to your friends let me know how it goes i don't know i was hanging out with uh my girlfriend the other day and i was like yo did you know batman had like lost media for a filipino series and there was like eight movies and you know they fought the devil and stuff and she was like oh that's so interesting and like let's look at let's look for the lost footage you know and here's youtube clips and so that's why i made this video early uh I wanted it to be easier for me to talk to people about Batman. Kind of why I made the Spider-Man deep dive too. I wanted to make it easier to like talk to someone about why I love Batman or Spider-Man and, and be able to go like a little bit deeper in it versus before. And dang man, making one of these videos is so educational just for myself. And I'm learning how to, you know, pronunciate and talk better in front of camera. It's very nice, very nice. Um, yeah, you guys are great. 
if you guys know of this, this I wanted my next video to be about Invincible and do a deep dive iceberg on that. I can't find any. So leave a comment and let me know if you could make one or if you uh, have found one online and I'll check it out. Uh, but yeah, I'm on the search for that and I would love to make a video about it. Um, it'd be a pleasure. So yeah, you guys have a great day. Till next time, it's Real T signing out. Stop hate, make love. Anybody can be a hero. Yeah, can't forget that. Peace.